Hi, Brent. Hi, Hi Donna. As a uh, as I indicated before we actually went live here is I'm Pastor Jennifer Felix here at Crossroads Church and I head up our recovery ministries, actually the whole care ministry area I oversee, specifically a ministry called Set Free, similar to a Celebrate Recovery, but, but it's tailored to meet the needs of, of our culture. And I wanted to thank you both so much for agreeing just to come on, interview with us and be able to share a little bit uh, of how Bobby Joe how you met Bobby Joe, uh, the impact she's had on you and the process that, that you both went through with getting to know her and sharing her story. So if I may, I'd like to go ahead and open us up in prayer. Okay. All right. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for both Brent and Donna. Father, I thank you for just the path that you had led them on and allowing them to cross paths with Bobby Joe, share her story, get to know her. And I pray, Father, that this interview will be one that is a blessing for not just them and myself, but a blessing for each and every person who is tuned in with us, Father, watching. In your name, amen. 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 Thank you for that. Absolutely. Well, to get started, I just wanted you to share, if you could please, or share a little bit about your background, where you're from, how you got involved in, in what it is you all do for a living, and, and transitioned into meeting Bobby Joe. Okay. Well, Donna and I lived in Los Angeles and uh, I made television commercials out there. I'm a director, I made television commercials. Uh, we moved our family back to Kansas City because our daughters are teenagers and we kind of wanted to get them in a, in a, uh, a little slower environment. <laughs> we were here in Kansas City and we were looking for a story. We wanted to do something that meant something. We wanted to do something. We've always wanted to make a film. And I was at a, uh, I was at a meeting and Bobby Joe was giving her testimony. And so I'm sitting in the back of this meeting and this woman starts in on her story and my jaw just dropped the minute she started in uh, because her story is just so incredible. And, and it proceeded to get, I've heard a lot of testimonies in a lot of meetings. I'm in recovery myself so and, and heard a lot of great stories. And her story was by far um, one of the darkest that I've heard. And, and the, the, the arc of her story coming out of that dark past and into the light, you know, that redemption story that it is just blew me away. And I went up to her afterwards. I mean, and I just said, listen, I, I'm a, I'm a filmmaker and I would love to tell your story. Is there some way maybe we could get together and, uh, and, and do a test. And, uh, and she goes, well, well, sure, honey. And then she gave me her book and she says, I'm down at Healing House. And if you want to come down, come on down anytime. And I said, okay. And I read her book and I said, I got to go put Bobby Joe on film. So we went down to um, Healing House and she started giving us a tour of the Pink House. And we did about three hours of filming. And I came home and she was just a dynamo. And we cut it all together. And I was like, this woman's amazing. She's got it. We have to make a film about her. You know, when we moved here, we weren't really aware of like how it was going to work. Was he going to be able to, you know, fly back and forth, be traveling constantly back and forth to Los Angeles to work? Or could we kind of, you know, do something that was our own here. And there is a great um, support system in the film community here, which we found quickly because once we met Bobby Joe, it was just on. And I mean, we're calling the film commission. We're, we're trying to staff up. We need, you know, uh, camera operators and, you know, editors. And we, it's almost like we couldn't staff up fast enough, but as people got involved and as people kind of would you know, show up on set and they might show up for a day to kind of work with us. They didn't really know us because we're, you know, strangers in the community. But man, when people started realizing what we were filming and who we were filming and, and the stories, it's like they wanted to come back. They wanted to keep participating with us. That is incredible. Now, Brent, you had mentioned is that you have a history with, with recovery, which made even working on Bobby Joe's story all the more personal. But if you guys can just kind of elaborate on that, of just how that, much that resonated. It was everything. I mean, I, I moved here and, and, and um, you know, they were my support group immediately. <laughs> so I was working and I was also in re recovery and hanging out with the people I'm supposed to be hanging out with, doing what I'm supposed to do. Hearing about their uh, journey from their dark places into life. I mean, I, I, I was caught up in it. You know, I was definitely caught up in it for years. And I had to do a lot of work to get out, you know, and, and, and going through the process that I went through, I needed people to help me. I learned a whole lot more about surrender 
and about um, turning it over and about every, you know, because this is, it, I don't think you're ever fully um, out of the woods, you know? I think you, you uh, and, and I, I've got to work at it. We all have to work at it. And doing this film was just more me working at it, you know? It was me going through the 12 steps again. I, I, I hope you could see the 12 steps in there. You know, I, it was it was loosely scripted through there, and every, we talked about all the steps. Didn't go over them one at a time because I didn't want it to be textbook. But I used um, I used the twelve steps as sort of a blueprint for the for the to, for the messaging. You know how I wanted people to be able to see it and go, okay, yeah, I get it. That's what's going on. You gotta. You know, you got to be around a group of people that are going to help you out. You got to, you got to be willing to get all that darkness out of it. You got to be willing to hand it over and 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 get to a really powerful place. You know, and what's gonna what's gonna help do that? And I don't. The, the one question I asked was, you know, did you have a spiritual experience? I asked everybody that, and everybody related their spiritual experience to us in different ways, and. I think it's revealed in there. I, did you kind of get that? I mean, how people were saying they they changed. I um, I loved the diversity of the different people that you showed. Um, mm -hmm. And you can tell I myself have a recovery background, so I have coming up on twenty six years, and so. Congratulations. Yeah. So so looking and watching it, it, it just is. We'd all like to say that we don't profile people, but the reality is we do. We all do. When we, we have the first impression based upon what it is we see. And then we have what it is we hear. And then we filter everything, our interpretation through what it is we see and what we hear. And uh, I loved hearing the, the, just the continuity of what each person was expressing that there was no judgment. I loved the idea of welcome home. So many of them, th those two words were so powerful or the recurring theme of hope. And in a circumstance that was either by, obviously by their own initial choice that, that led them down a deep, dark hole that took them to places. Nobody ever wakes up one day and says, I want to be a drug addict and I want to be homeless and I want to have all this stuff happen. It, it doesn't start off that way. But that's a lot of times where it ends. And, right. uh, and, and you wind up at, at a degree of hopelessness and so I loved the theme of just people were given hope that they didn't have to stay where they were at. And, and, and it wasn't a pipeline dream that wasn't achievable. It, it was, it is achievable. It is accessible and it's for them personally. Well, so. I know that we just have a, a minute or two left for this interview, but like I said, uh, for the purpose of our interview, many of our viewers are, are involved within our ministry called set free and, and much of our ministry is is geared towards people who struggle with various addictions. It may not be drugs. Many it may be. It could be alcohol or pornography or sex, whatever the, the addiction or dependency is. And we also have people that struggle with mental health challenges, with anxiety, with depression, and things of that nature, with uh, trauma and PTSD. But if you could give just some words of encouragement to our audience as, as they're getting ready now to, you know, we're going to shift over and they're going to meet Bobby Joe themselves. And, and this interview is, is taking place after the, the film has been viewed for the amount of people that were able to view it from Crossroads. But what would you, what would you like to just uh, express to them as after maybe some of them have watched the documentary and now they're getting to kind of say, get an end, uh, a closer, up close meeting with Bobby Joe herself. I, I would say this, you know, no matter what you've been through, no matter how far down you've gone, no matter, you know, you have, there is, there is hope for you. There's definitely hope for you. And when you see, I hope you saw it in Bobby Joe. I so hope you saw it in her story because she's forgiven everyone in her life. And then she, she, was in a horrible situation and she got out of it. And then she went right back into it to save the very people that caused all this chaos in her life. So in order to do that, she had to forgive all of those people, all of those resentments. And then she went back in to try to help them. Now that's, that's a tall order. So if you can, 
if you can see your way to get a little bit of 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 that that faith that Bobby Joe has, that there is goodness inside of you, that there is light inside of you, that you can bring that light out, that you can get out of that darkness. Because we've all we all go there. Don't get stuck there. You can get out. You can get out. If you you know you get around people like Bobby Joe and and the people in your recovery group, they're gonna help you. You gotta ask for the help and you really gotta want it. And then once you get a little bit of that glimmer of hope, you gotta give it back. <laughs> so, you know, and then the other thing, one of the great things I heard in the meeting is that breathe in faith and exhale fear is one of my favorite ones. And that's just one moment at a time. Just breathe in that faith and just get that fear out, man. It's going to be all right. I mean, I seen the darkest of the dark in, in, in where we were and with Bobby Joe. And I've seen her, I, I know she came out of it and I know she was guided out of it. And you can be guided out of it, too. So hang in there. Well, I want to thank you both for taking the time out of your day just to meet with me, share with our with our audience, with our group, and and for us just to be given the privilege to to view this film and this documentary and and to get a glimpse into the life of Bobby Joe is such a blessing. And and to me personally, it is an encouragement to remind me that that hope is is still there. It's still active, still we all can use a little bit more hope in all different areas of our life. So uh, I want to generate it. Yeah. Generate it together. We do it together. We just right? do it together. We generate that hope together. You can generate that darkness, but we can generate that light. So that's what we try to do with the film. We're just trying to bring some light to the world and, and it's possible. It's so possible. There's so yeah. many possibilities. You can do it. Well, you're going to need, you got to ask, you got to want it. You got to have, you got to ask for that help. I, I'm sure you've helped a lot of people. So, Right. Well, again, thank you very much. I know Bobby Joe is probably anticipating the call from us, knowing that we were going to sign in with her right after with, uh, you know, taking the time with you both. But I just want to wish a blessing upon you both. This is an incredible documentary and film that you have put together. Thank you so much. And thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you for sharing our film with your with your community. We are so very grateful and blessed. All right. Thank you very much. I hope you guys have a great rest of your day. All right. right. Thank you so much for your time. Hey, everyone. With me tonight is Bobby Joe. Bobby Joe's story is one of redemption, is, is one of hope, and is one that I hope that you are blessed with. I know that watching her documentary and film of her life was an absolute blessing for me. And so tonight I have with me Bobby Joe. And, and Bobby Joe, again, thank you so much for for agreeing to come on, be a part of the interview, share a little bit more about your story. Um, as I have shared with you uh, just a few moments prior to us beginning the interview, I'm the pastor of our Set Free Ministry here. But as I do with everybody that I interview, is I always love to ask God into, into the room. Yeah. And so I'd love to be able to go ahead and pray and just ask God's hand to be upon our time that we have Okay. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for Bobby Joe. Father, I thank you for the work that you are doing within her and the work that you are doing through her. She truly is a reflection of your heart in being the hands and the feet of Jesus. And Father, I pray that each and every person who is tuned in with us right now, Father God, finds her to be a blessing as much, if not more so, than I know that what I have already found her to be. In your name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Well, Bobby Joe, I have had the privilege now of watching your film three times. <laughs> and <laughs> just there's so much in there. there there's so yeah. much in there. And it's and it's just such a blessing. And and one of the things that I'm probably gonna refer to uh, many times throughout our interview is there's two words that really hit me. It is you spoke about the idea of missing hope. And um yes. You know, and there's so many different aspects of your life that chipped away at, at hope that I'd like for you to, to think about the, the various dark paths because there was many dark paths that you went through. It wasn't just one dark path. You just, it was like as if it couldn't get worse, it kept getting worse. Right. Right? Now, when you think about your childhood and you think about your, your thoughts and your feelings and, and just going way back there, could you share with our audience some of the 
some of those feelings and some of those struggles that you were wrestling with before you ever even picked up the bottle of, of alcohol or the drug, that what were you, what were you experiencing even just from a mental health place and, right. and, and that led you down to those, those being the options of, for solutions? Sure. Um, well, I had um, two older brothers and I was the baby and the only girl. My dad was a Kansas City, Kansas police officer, and they didn't make great money, and so he always worked two jobs. My mother, I remember when I was a pretty small child that uh, my mother had to go away for a while, and uh, it was a nervous breakdown is what they called it back then. And um, she came back. My mom had lots of anger issues. I have a dad. She's at home with no car with three little kids. And my dad's at work all the time. And so I'm sure she had her own battles. And then now I, I recognize that she had mental health, health issues as well. Um, she was angry. She cursed a lot. Um, when I was coming up, I was a chubby kid. My brother, one year older than me, had inner deafness that was undiagnosed till he was about 12. And so I emulated his speech. So we both had speech impediments. So I'm kind of this chubby kid with a speech impediment, a mom that's kind of out of control at home, and a, a dad that I longed for, just to spend time with him. And <clears throat> I was uh, not... I had a brother that was super duper smart. I was not one of those great students. And uh, I would, another brother, both the boys could were good at sports. And I always felt like there was no way to shine or be seen by my dad is pretty much how it felt. And um, so there were many things coming up. I was always, uh, from the time I was about, Ten, I started breaking bones all the time. Well, of course, whatever my brothers were doing, I had to do it too. So if they're going to jump over the ravine, I'm going to jump over the ravine. But <laughs> I didn't quite have the momentum to get over it, so I ended up at the bottom of the ravine. Anyway, um, so there were a lot of things. Uh, you know, it's funny, when I got sober, before I got sober, I used to, my brothers used to say how dysfunctional our family was, our home life. And I always said, no, it's not. What are you guys talking about? And now that they're older, they think, oh, it wasn't so bad. And I'm thinking, once I got sober, I'm like, man, that was craziness. <laughs> and so it's, it's um, well, they know it was dysfunctional, but they kind of made it less. And I, once I finally got sober and a sound mind, I really seen how dysfunctional our home was. And so, uh, that, that pretty much, uh, set the pace, always had low self-esteem, always felt less than, uh, you know, uh, fear. We operated in a lot of fear because my mom was, uh, um, physically abusive at times as well. And the cussing and screaming, and that in itself is dysfunction to me, come to find out, <laughs> once I came to know the Lord. Fighting is not a requirement for a family. Screaming and yelling is not, not okay. It's not healthy. And so uh, I've learned a lot. I mean, you know, uh, whatever you're raised around is your normal. And it feels normal to you because that's all you've ever known. And so that's kind of the early years. Well, I know that you said when you came to the faith. And, and so talk a little bit about growing up in your family. Did God play a, a role in that? Were you introduced to God? Or at what point were you introduced to not just, say, a higher power, but you're introduced to God, a, a believing faith in Christ? Um, so we, I remember uh, going to Sunday school sometimes. My parents didn't go to church. Me and my brothers would walk to uh, Sunday school, it, but it was never consistent. Um, at like five, I was standing on a little stool doing the house laundry, stuff like that. So my mom was kind of caught up 
Also, another thing I should say is that back in those days, the uh, a lot of the housewives took diet pills, which we know is speed. And then <laughs> they would have anxiety, and so then they'd give them value. So it was a roller coaster ride. But mom wants it really, we weren't engaged. We really didn't hear about God unless it was in the wrong context. And uh, so I didn't really have a knowledge. I thought, yes, there's a God. If I'm bad, I'm going to hell. That was about, and I knew uh, Jesus. I didn't really know what part Jesus played. I really knew, I, you could almost say, oh, almost knew nothing about the Lord. Um, so after I got sober, uh, and I think I talk about it in the movie, I'm not sure. I started dating a guy and he returned to his addiction and um, in and out of my life. And one time I let him come back home and he said, you know, you need to start going to church with me because he had got involved in a church group. And I said, no, I don't want to go to church. You know, I go to AA. That's that's my thing. And so then he started coming home and said, you know, we're not going to be able to be together because we're not equally yoked. <laughs> so of course I should have said, you're correct. You're a crackhead and I'm not, but we're not equally yoked. <laughs> But instead, uh, I throw my little red mini dress on and I go to this church and the praise and worship part was OK. I, I really didn't like all the pr preaching and stuff. I went I'd go to praise and worship and then I'd go uh, to a meeting and uh, my mother passed away on. Uh, but I was going. I was going. I was making some friendships there. I started decorating the church and uh, getting involved in community work. And um, my mom, six months into my recovery, my mom was re -di diagnosed with cancer. But on the, um, she died 1998, December 30th. So on New Year's Eve, I was out running around uh, trying to find an urn for her ashes. And uh, I was living in a little house. I was sober. And I had two roommates that had relapsed. And then I had the boyfriend that was in and out with relapses. And um, anyway, so we were supposed to be doing something at the church that night. We were going to go out there for some kind of party, get together. And um, so I came, I found the urn. I came back to my home and my boyfriend was gone. And I thought, you know what? Surely he wouldn't leave me now. Not right after my mom died, and he wouldn't do this. So I drove out to the church, and he wants it there. And um, I just started welling. And, you know, I'd been alone and frightened and scared out in the street. But now my dad had died three and a half years before. My mom had just passed. My boyfriend's gone. My two roommates are gone. And it felt like everything had been removed in a swipe of the hand. And um, so I started crying. I went back to the house, my house, and um, I just started praying to God. And I begged God not to let me go back to where I came from and to lead and direct me and just be with me. And uh, I fell asleep that night praying and crying. And when I woke up um, January 1st of 1999, my life has never been the same. The Holy Spirit took it, took it up residence in me. And um, that morning when I woke was the first time I'd ever felt like things were going to be okay. And you would say Not that in that moment, would you say that that's when you had that kind of like coming to Jesus moment where, where you invited him in or was there a time? I had invited him in. I think that I was still a work in pro progress, uh, for sure, because, you know, we still have free will, and I tried to take some things back, but my thinking about things uh, were different. was different. I quit settling for stuff like I used to, and I mean, it wasn't like, boom, I just knew that morning when I woke up that everything was going to be okay, and then I had to go through... Uh, I mean, I went through a lot, but God continued to guide my steps. Not to say I didn't step off, step off the path occasionally, <laughs> uh, but he redirected me back on it 
immediately. I, he changed me. And I wouldn't have known it at that very moment, but it started being very clear that he had right. changed me. So after that point, I did find a, a home church, and I started going to church, and I started getting fed. I looked, I was in, I looked in the Bible, read in the Bible for a year and a half, and I thought, man, I must be stupid. I'm not getting this stuff. I just ain't, it's not getting me. And my pastor at that time said, Bobby Joe, you need to ask the Holy Spirit for, so he can show you what the word is telling you. And um, so I started praying for the Holy Spirit to give me understanding of God's word. And when I started doing that, all that year and a half I'd been reading, it was like, you know, the big light bulb that goes, bing. <laughs> it was like that. And I remember going back to church and I said, Pastor, Pastor, I got it. And he's like, what? <laughs> Stepping back. And I'm like, I've got it. I, I got it. I get it now. And uh, not to say that I've got it, but you know what I mean. Right. It's like all of a sudden things started making sense. All of the words I had been reading all of a sudden became very clear. And that was a gift from the Holy Spirit. I totally believe that. Uh, share with our group a little bit. I, I mean, because obviously, you know, our group set free is a ministry here at the church. And, and there are aspects. And again, you know, I support all Bible believing, gospel preaching churches. When uh -huh. it comes to recovery, there's different philosophies. There's the 12 steps and then there's the one step. A a accept Christ, everything is better. Mm. And from my perspective, I have my own belief. Accept Christ, your salvation is secured. But not everything always is better. There's right. process. There's, there's partnership. And, and mm. so there's still value. And, and God will take us to the destination, but he also wants us to partner with him along the journey. Right. And, and so right. talk a little bit maybe about just how the 12 steps, you know, uh, and God actually meshed together. Now, we know the 12 steps, is, it really points to the higher power. Mm -hmm. But, you know, which is, from my view, when if you've never had any background with faith at all, it is a stepping stone towards towards a saving faith, which, right. which is incredible. Right. But but it's not the end. You don't like the, the goal is is the cross. The goal is the relationship. So share a little bit, if you if you would, just about those tools of the 12 steps and the meetings. And and it, did you seek outside professional help with dealing with everything that had happened. I mean, like I said, every experience, whether it was the drugs, the alcohol, the rapes, the prostitution, the beatings, it was that complete, we call it a gift of desperation, but, but the moment of demoralization doesn't feel like a gift in the moment. No, no. And, 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 and grabbing the right tools off the shelf to help with each layer that that bring comes to the surface, right? How did that? How did your faith play out in that? How did how did working the steps or having a sponsor or continued the meetings? Steps, uh, the twelve steps really gave me my foundation. I was uh, very engaged in the twelve step recovery process, and um, I believed in it. I sponsored people. I worked with tons of tons of folks. I carried the message, the 12 step message to detoxes, hospitals, treatment centers, everywhere. And I tell you what, at about three and a half uh, years into my recovery, I came to a jumping off place. And so I didn't want to drink anymore or get high, but I was stuck. I was just stuck. And um, I didn't it felt like, is this all recovery is? Is this all it is? I work, I go to meetings, I do this, I do that. And is that it? Is this going to be this endless cycle of just what I'm doing now? And that is really the same time when, God, when I built my relationship with Christ. And what I found, this 12 steps is an amazing tool to look at yourself. Look at your circumstances. Um, really start to compartmentalize the different events in your life and why you became you and why um, 
some of the circumstances happen in your life. But Jesus set me free for me. Because I was still, just because I was sober, I still had the same thinking. I still had the same feelings. I still had the low self-esteem. I did not gain self-esteem until I come to know how loved I was. And I was a daughter of the Most High King and how precious and how much value I had to Him. Once I knew the value that I had with Him, that's what built me up and gave me self-esteem. Um, I knew when I started Healing House, though, is that it would be a combination of both because I knew there was a bunch more people just like me and I couldn't have just walked into church and by osmosis said, oh, I'm better now. It, it, it took a lot more than that. Um, not to say that God is not a healer and can take addiction from people, but I'm a, I, <laughs> I'm a real chronic alcoholic and addict. And so... It was the combination of both that worked for me. And so I really knew that's um, what I was going to do. Some of the girls I was working with lived at a recovery homes that are not spiritually based. And <clears throat> I remember one of them told me, um, you know, I feel uncomfortable when my roommate's boyfriend spends the night with us. And I'm like, what? And she said, oh, yeah. Boyfriends get to spend the night in the same room with you? Yeah. <laughs> oh I'm like, well, God. you ought to feel uncomfortable. That's freaky. That's not okay. <laughs> and so I knew that, you know, that was way to the other side. So I knew that, you know, our literature tells us we have a daily reprieve contingent on a fit spiritual condition. And so I knew AA got me sober, but God made me whole. And God, the relationship, the intimate relationship that I have with Christ is, you know what? I never feel alone. I never feel abandoned. I, I don't run in fear anymore. And I used to run in fear every single day of my life. Fear of being like, fear of being good enough, fear of money. Fear, it talks about it in some of the AA literature. And since I've been in my relationship with God, I just feel complete. And, you know, I'm the most blessed woman in the world because God brought me out of all that. And now I get to do each and every day what I know God created me for. And there's no better place in the world to be there. I mean, I'm serving him. I'm, I'm doing my purpose here on earth. I believe it was the reason I was born to do what I'm doing. Well, I know based on, on just the, the film and, and what I've seen, it is what a blessing. You never work a day in your life when you love what you do and it's the purpose that you That's believe right. been called, called to. That's right. Going off of the 12 steps, much much of our group, one of the challenges that we have found, not maybe directly inside of Set Free, but just uh, culturally on a larger scale, is when people hear the term, the 12 steps, they automatically assume it's only for drug addicts and alcoholics. And, and, and so share with me a little bit, share with our audience a little bit, how has the 12 steps been a useful tool in working through other issues, other things like, like abuse, like rape, like prostitution, like, you know, just fill in the blank. I'm powerless over you fill in the blank. How, right. had, how has the 12 steps been beneficial in that way within your life and working through um, things that are outside? Because some of our, our attenders here at Set Free, they are not addicts and they're not, they're not alcoholics. And, and so, and so the, then the uh, um, easy go-to is saying, well, the 12 steps don't apply to me. And, and so we're constantly saying, no, the 12 steps actually applies to anybody and everybody who desires to work them within their lives. That's right. So if there's stuff to me, the 12 steps, if you have something that's making your life unmanageable, right? Anything. I remember years ago, I went to treatment and um, there was a lady there that was in there for sugar addiction. Now, I went out. I did two years uh, of recovery after that, but I didn't find God. And I did go back out for eight more years of um, research. <laughs> Very <laughs> awful research. But 
everybody, I remember everybody was fussing. Well, her thing's just sugar. Why is she here? And I said, well, if it, it doesn't matter what it is, if it makes you feel bad or creates problems in your life. And this 12 steps really gives you, the, I mean, to me, the whole 12 steps is from God. He used Bill and Bob to come up with this. And if you really, if you look at step 10, 11, and 12, right? So you're taking a daily inventory, you're apologizing. Uh, you sought through prayer and meditation to improve your conscious contact with God. You carried these message to other people that are still suffering. What does that sound like? Discipleship. <laughs> <laughs> Those steps are discipleship. And um, there is so much God in the steps. And if you work with whatever you're going through, um, it can be anxiety. It can be depression. It can be um you know food it it could be anything if it's gossip you know gossip what does james tell us your tongue sets your whole can set a whole forest on fire right <laughs> or tongue so if you're a gossip these 12 steps i mean the 12 steps are amazing and they're god sent i believe that wholeheartedly I am absolutely in agreement with you. They can be applied in, in so many different areas of our life. Yes. The one hurdle is is it's kind of like the 12 steps or a mirror. Are we willing to look? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's Are we willing to look? In your documentary, you uh, had your friend who many refer to as Mama Judy. Mm -hmm. And that really touched me because... Um, the friendship you and her had developed was so strong and so powerful and so genuine that it, it's, you know, who wouldn't want a friendship where it's like uh, Thelma and Louise, it's yeah. partners in crime, right? Right. It, it's such a special thing. And, and I, first I want to say, I'm truly sorry for her passing. It, it's, and, and just to share with you a little bit of how personal it is that she actually passed away on my belly button birthday. Oh, so really? March 13th is my, is my birthday. So oh. when, when I saw that at the very end, it was just, it, it was just one of those like, wow, it just, you know, a little nugget that, that God personalized it somehow for me. Yes. And, um, share with our audience just how important it is to have the collective group, but then to have kind of like your people, your, your tribe, your, your inner circle of those people and and how did you work through the grief of losing of losing judy uh i believe that i'm still in the grieving process a little bit um judy when judy came to me seven over 17 years ago she's 103 pounds and on a walker and she was 15 years older than me so she really didn't want to hear what this not nosed little kid <laughs> was telling her. And she said, uh, I'm much older than you. I know what I'm doing. I said, well, you knew what you were doing, but now we're going to try a different way, right? <laughs> when she first got there. And we became fast friends, though, because what I could see in her was a passion to help others. And um, Judy was, I tell you what, she helped me build this ministry up. I mean, when she came, it was nine months after I started. And she was by my side through all of this. We became one another's confidant, um, best friends, best buddies. And we would, uh, we lived in the house with 10 women new in recovery for many years. And so neither one of us got to sleep much more than four hours a night. And they were mom, mom, all night. They called me mom. They called her mom and Judy. But um, Judy was a person that I could share my feelings with my disappointments, my hopes, and my dreams with, and um, just, I, I, just a most, a remarkable, remarkable, she, I did an interview, I just got a uh, award for Mom and Judy, I just take that earlier today for Lifetime Achievement Award, and um, they said if you could make one sentence about Judy, I said, what would it be? And I said, a gift from God to the world. And that's exactly the truth. Now, she was ornery, don't get me wrong. <laughs> but you got to be a little ornery to do the work we do. But um, she was my best friend. 
she was my ministry partner. We were roommates for 17 years. Um, it was such a blessing, though, that when the time was coming um, that I was able to be here for, um, it was really difficult for me. I was hospitalized uh, three times in two months when she got sick. My body, I mean, it was so hard. And not just emotionally, but it was attacking me physically. And I knew that I couldn't let Satan win. I was not going to let him win because if he could take us both out at once, that would have been his scheme, you know. And so I was able to be there for her. I helped my friend with every need that she had as she transitioned uh, to get ready to go home. I, um, I, we had a dining room down on the main floor. Judy wasn't able to do the steps anymore. So while she was in the hospital, I set up two twin beds down there and I made it our bedroom. So I'd be right there by her. Um, and had a tub put in so she'd be comfortable and I could be with her all the time. And one day they had to come in and put an oxygen machine in and they had to move the bed over about a foot. So instead of being three feet away from me or two feet, she was a foot farther away from me. And that night when we laid in bed and sometimes she just lay there and cry and say that she was scared or she didn't want to go yet, you know, and, um, but she would say that first night they moved the bed over, but she said, buddy, we always call one another, buddy, buddy, it seems like we're too far away from one another. I said, honey, they only moved it about a foot. She said, well, I still think it's kind of too far. And then the next night she said, it again. Hmm. so I'm like, all right, I got up. I moved my bed over one more foot to be closer <laughs> to her. We were, um, Judy was my heart. Judy truly was my gift from God to help uh, grow. And people can tell you, Judy changed their life. Judy would tell everybody that came into the program, well, she copied after me, but she used it for 15, 16 years. She'd tell everybody that came in, welcome mm -hmm. home. Yeah. And the welcome home thing, and they call they call me mom, but they call her Mama Judy, and it's because to a lot of people she was more like a, a kind of a grandmother spirit, but she always made every person that she came in contact with feel special, and that she cared for them, and she could remember everything. I've never met anybody with a mind like her. She could remember. Everybody that lived here, their children's names, their parents' names, it was incredible. So they felt a very close, intimate relationship with Mama Judy, and she did make everybody feel loved and special. So um, it was very difficult to lose her for me personally and for the ministry because right. everybody loved Mama Judy. But the one thing, I know that she went to heaven I know that she's with our Lord and I know we'll be reunited um, again. We, anytime we used to be driving down the road, and there'd be big fluffy clouds. She'd say, buddy, one day we're going to be jumping on those clouds. And so she's just jumping before me, but uh, we'll be together again. Um, and I know that God even though the grief has been really intense. And then we didn't get closure because the whole COVID thing. We had to wait six months before we could have a homegoing service. And, um, but I know God has me here for a reason and he still has work for me to do. Right. And um, so I step out in faith every day that there's some more for me to accomplish here before I go home. And so I'm just going to give it my 110 every day serving the Lord until he takes me there. What a blessing to have a friend such as, such as Judy oh, in your yeah. life. As we wrap up, I just have one uh, last question. And really, it's more or less I'm just asking you to share something. You know, our group is so diverse and our audience is so diverse that 
What would you share with, say, our group of individuals that have the various challenges of, of mental health, of, of addictions? What was, what's the one thing that you'd want them to walk away from knowing? That God has a plan. And I talk about this in the movie, but I totally believe this. Um, we, if we are without hope, we will dwindle away. We need to know that we are loved. We are precious in God's sight. And God has a plan and a purpose for each and every one of us. Yours might not be at all like mine. But still, I feel a commitment to God to give him my best every day and to serve him. And hope, hope and love. Man, those two things are so key to let people know that they are loved, not only by God, but us. And also, there's hope for each and every one of us, no matter how far down you've gotten. Um, God has something for you to do. If he didn't have stuff for us to do, we wouldn't be here. And so the one thing, even my addiction, uh, I was never a quitter. And I don't give up. And if God tells me I'm going to do something, I, what does it say? What who, he ordains, he maintains, right? Right. And so I trust in him. I step out in faith when he puts up it on my heart that this is what we're supposed to do. This is what he wants me to do. I step out in faith on that. And I know God is a redeemer, a restorer, and a healer. And no matter where you're at in your journey or what your struggles may be, God is able if you just believe. What, um, this is just that one last question that came to mind is, do you have a life scripture that you just refer back to? I mean, all of scripture we, we know is the totality is, yes. is applicable and, and true. But do you have that one scripture that you would reference as your life verse? I don't want to mess it up, but I believe it's Proverbs 31 about the wife of a noble character. And it talks about how um, her, her, uh, she works day and night. She uh, buys fields and she sells them and that her house never has to fear of, you know, not being fed or not having the needs they need because she gives it her all every day. And I just, do you have that scripture pulled up? Let me, Jesse's pulling it up for me. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, here we go. A wife of a noble character who can find a virtuous and capable wife. She is more precious than rubies. Her husband can trust her and she will greatly enrich his life. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She finds wool and flax and busily spins it. She is like a merchant ship bringing her food from afar. She gets up before dawn to prepare breakfast for her household and plan the day's work for her servant girls. She goes to inspect a field and buys it. With her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She is energetic and strong, a hard worker. She makes sure her dealings are profitable. Her lamp burns late into the night. Her hands are busy spinning thread, her fingers twisting fiber. She extends a helping hand to the poor and opens her arms to the needy. She has no fear of the winter for her household, for everyone has warm clothes. And then it goes, she makes her own bedspread. She dresses in fried linen and purple gowns. Her husband is well known at the city gates. And I think that's the most, uh, she is clothed in strength and dignity. And she laughs without fear of the future. When she speaks, her words are wise. And she gives instructions with kindness. She carefully watches everything in her household and suffers nothing from laziness. And then her children stand and call her blessed. Um, I just, I like that. Um, to me, it's, it's who I am. Not that I'm a married woman, um, Jesus is my everything. I don't need a husband. Um, all that has been taken away from me. I'm just really living into it, my creation. And um, I like that because some days, you know, many days I work 16 hours a day and 
I'm dealing with people's life on a daily basis and it doesn't stop at five o'clock. You know, it's all the time, 24-7, and God equips me with every tool I need to be able to keep continue on. And um, I just, I think, and, and then, you know, how God can take us out of the ashes, and, you know, he takes the, what does it say? The word says that he takes the, um, oh, what is it, the foolish thing? Uh, I can't think of the scripture. Anyway, he will use us, the ones of us that are messed up. And how glorifying is it to him that he could take a wretch like me, right? That was lost and hopeless. That he can take somebody like me, the worst of the worst in my eyes, and use me today to help, you know. Well, uh, it was 8,000. We've helped over 10,000 people. In the last 18 years, we provided homes for, and um, it was about eight when we did the filming of the movie, but um, it's a remarkable life, one I could have never imagined. Well, God, Brought to you by God. <laughs> God always takes us farther than we could ever imagine. That's right. That's right. Bobby Joe, I want to thank you so much for just joining with me here today. Sure. and taking the time to, to do this interview for us. I'll be sure to make sure that you have access to the link for when it is, it is viewed. Um, thank you again so much. It, it, it is such a blessing. And who knows, you might just, I might just send you an email just because. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you are, I, you are so incredible. And, and to close up, I would love if you would bless me, bless our audience, if you would just uh, say a little closing prayer for us. I would love to. Um, our Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for all the blessings that you bestowed on us already throughout this day. You are an awesome God. Father, I ask that when the folks um, get to see this documentary, Lord, that I know your hand was in and over Father, we just ask that you open hearts and minds. And, Father, let your glory shine through this movie, Father. Let people get hope and understand how merciful and full of grace you are and that you have a plan for us, Lord. We just ask that you bless everybody, bless Jennifer um, and the folks there at Crossroads. Lord, and all that uh, are able to watch this. And Father, let it be a blessing unto them. Let them just fill up with the fire to serve you, Lord. We just love you. We thank you for all things, great and small. But above all, Lord, we just want to say thank you for our Savior, the sacrifice that he made for us by shedding his blood to wash us clean. Thank you, Lord. And it's in Jesus Christ's mighty and powerful name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Bobby Joe, thank you. You're welcome. You. I hope you have an incredible day and I will be lifting you up in prayer as, as you continue you. In, in your journey, in your faith walk of, of what you're doing and in your grief with, with losing such a dear friend. I, yes. I myself understand, understand yes. grief. It just doesn't go yes. away instantaneously. And, and so Absolutely. I know I've been blessed by you all just in the short time we've had together. Oh, amen. Well, thank you. And uh, you're awesome. <laughs> I hope you all know when they got there. So you're pretty awesome. <laughs> it's uh, been a joy talking to you. Yes. And, and I, yes, I'm, gosh, I'm excited to see just how much more God does, does through you and the work you guys are doing. Amen. If you ever come to Kansas City, come visit. I, I just might. Don't don't tempt me. I got a I got a big house. i uh, you could come stay at my house. So absolutely. Love to have you. Okay. Well again, I'm okay. gonna let you go so you can go about your day. And and again, thank, thank you very much and God bless. God bless you, honey. Thank you so much. Uh-huh. Bye okay. bye. Bye bye. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed the interview that I just had with Bobby Joe. I know it was a blessing for me, just really hoping that it was a blessing for you as well. But tonight's Tuesday night, so what it is that's gonna happen next is we're gonna jump over to our Zoom platform for small group time. 
Our small groups are gender specific on Tuesday nights. The link will be at the bottom of the screen. If you're watching and it's not a Tuesday night, in addition to Tuesday nights, we also have small groups that happen on Saturday mornings from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. Saturday morning group is a co-ed mixture of a group, but guess what? I'm even in there, Pastor Jen, love to meet with you, connect with you in that way, so join us on a Saturday morning. We also currently right now have an intro to the 12 steps group that happens on Thursday nights. And the 5.30 group is for women and the 7 p.m. group is for men. We'd love to have you jump on in for that one as well. So there's many different options, but the link to join any of them, whether it's a Tuesday night, Thursday night, Saturday morning, is at the bottom of the screen. And don't forget, be sure to hit that subscribe button. And if you know somebody that you believe could benefit from our set free ministry or even more specifically with the interview that I just did with Bobby Joe, be sure to hit that share button and also hit that bell icon to be notified anytime we go live or anything happens here on our YouTube channel. But in the meantime, I hope you have a great week. God bless, and we'll see you all next week.